Hey, what's going on? So today we are going to talk about how to play Raging Bolt. We're going to go over deck list options, then sequencing, and I'm going to go a little bit into some probability type stuff. And at the end, it's going to be prize mapping and a little bit of the matchups. So first of all, I just want to start by going over, you know, the deck itself and how it works. Raging Bolt's a 240 hit point basic dragon Pokemon with no weakness and as an attack for a colorless burst drawer, discard your hand, draw six and Bellowing Thunder for Lightning Fighting. It does 70 for each energy you discard from any of your Pokemon. So that's any type of energy. So to accelerate extra energy into play, we play Teal Mask Ogre Pond. It has an ability, Teal Dance. Once during your turn, you may attach a Grass Energy from your hand to this Pokemon. If you do, draw a card. And for three Grass, it has an attack that does 30 plus 30 more damage for each energy attached to both active Pokemon. So this is good for hitting into grass weak Pokemon or knocking out just generally low HP Pokemon that we don't want to discard energy to knock out with Raging Bolt. We have Sandy Shocks as our one prize attacker. It does 20 plus 70 more damage if we have at least three energy attached to our Pokemon. So this can be good for knocking out Mimikyu's or just like evolving basics like Charmander's or Ralts. And for our support Pokemon, we have Squawkabilly, Pheasantipity, and Greninja. Squawkabilly lets us discard our hand, draw six on the first turn. Pheasantipity is a great addition to this deck. If one of our Pokemon was knocked out during our opponent's last turn, we can draw three cards. And then Greninja just discard an energy, draw two. These are solid support Pokemon. You could also play Mew EX that lets you draw up to three cards once during your turn. And it also has an attack for three colorless that copies one of our opponent's active Pokemon's attacks. So that can be relevant because you can copy a Mimikyu and Mimikyu's attack says put seven damage counters on the active Pokemon. So if we copy that with Mew, it not only knocks out the Mimikyu, but it goes through the effect of Mimikyu's ability. So it can definitely be a good, pretty versatile option. The list that's been on screen is the list that got top eight at the World Championships. James Goring played it and it's just a pretty solid, straightforward, consistent list, which you can't really go wrong with with Raging Bolt. The two things that I would take note of is he did choose to play Bravery Charms and didn't choose to play a Mew EX. I know a lot of the lists haven't been playing Mew EX lately, but I think Mew is still always a solid option. And he also played Super Odd over the Night Stretcher. Now this is the average number of cards that every Raging Bolt deck from day two played in its list. So we can kind of see what everyone was thinking. Like everyone played four Sada, four Nest Ball, four Vessel, three Energy Retrieval, three Lightning, three Fighting, one Squawkabilly, and one Pheasantipity. And then all of the other cards seem to have a little variance, like people would play one or one more or one fewer copies. Like it looks like most of the people played for Raging Bolt and for Teal Mask, but some people did play three. Also something else to take note of is at least one person played on Fair Stamp, which I think is a pretty good option in the deck right now. And people also played Judge too. A couple of people did or someone played like a couple of copies of it or something like that. And for the most part, everyone played six grass energy even though probably one or two people did play seven. It also looks like the top eight Raging Bolt was probably the only one in day two to be playing Super Odd instead of one or two Night Stretchers. This is my Raging Bolt list. Now, I only play the three Raging Bolt and three Ogre Pond to fit in two Night Stretchers. I really like the versatility of Night Stretcher, especially with cards like Iron Bundle. It also can just be an energy when you need it to draw with Ogre Pond or Greninja. And I'm also really shocked that the best performing list at Worlds did not play an Iron Bundle because that card seemed so necessary in the deck to start off the game with, you know, taking two prizes. I'm also playing unfair stamp instead of prime catcher which i do think is pretty good in aggressive decks like this right now you do have to find the spot for the fourth uh pokemon catcher when you cut the prime catcher but i think it's worth it because it can be really good against the one prize decks like ancient box or lost box if you happen to run into any of those but i also think it can be quite good against decks like gardevoir and charizard where you reset their hand to two and knock out either their support Pokemon or their only attacker or something like that. And you can just put on a lot more pressure with unfair stamp. And I was kind of thinking about it like the old Rayquaza list from worlds like four or five years ago where they would use Marshadow Let Loose, which is like a judge on an ability and then just start knocking out Pokemon. 
It is obviously not the same because you can't unfair stamp your opponent like before they get to even play a supporter card, but it can be quite effective in a number of matchups. I'm also not playing any bravery charms. In my head, they kind of seem like a win more card and they've never really been that effective when I've played them. And this is what the Dustnor version of the deck looks like. The Pokemon catchers were cut for a 101 Dustnor line because they're kind of trying to accomplish the same thing, just fixing the prize trade. And while Pokemon catchers will let you bring up a two prize Pokemon off the bench to take two prizes, the Dustnor can let you knock out a one prizer while while also knocking out another one extra later with the Dustnor line. And as long as you don't have any of your own one prizers in play, it really will not affect the prize trade because your opponent will go down to one prize and they'll still have to knock out a two prize Pokemon to win. All right, now on to sequencing and stuff. The first thing I wanted to mention is just make sure that when playing Raging Bull, you always have access to the energy types that you need. Because you are running three types of energy, it can be important to make sure you select the correct ones off of vessels or energy retrievals. Like don't take all the energy out of your discard pile except grass and then you only have grass to use Sada. And then Sada, like grass on a Raging Bolt is useless. And when grabbing energy out of the deck, if you already have a lightning for your Sada, grab a fighting and a grass energy so that you have the other type of energy to attach to Raging Bolt. And whenever you can for the extra energy, grass usually wants to be the selection so that if you find your way into another Ogre Pond, you already have the out to draw an extra card in your hand. Alright, so the main kind of tricky part, I guess, sequencing with this deck is the combination of Nest Ball, Tracking Shoes, Vessel, Pokey Gear, those types of cards. And really all that you have to think about is what cards are you looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for, you're never going to be able to sequence any turn correctly. So figuring out what you're looking for and then playing your cards in the order where the cards that you play at the beginning of the turn take as many cards that are not what you're looking for out of the deck. So if all you want to find is a supporter and you have a vessel and a nest ball in your hand and a pokey gear, you would nest ball for a Pokemon vessel for two energy and then use the pokey gear. And if you also had trekking shoes in your hand, you would just use the trekking shoes before the pokey gear as well. This is another like common thing that's easy to get wrong. It's the same thing as with comfy. You want to use comfy before pokey gear. The best way to go about it is to just use all of the cards that draw cards directly into your hand before Poke Gear. Because if we can use Greninja, then Trekking Shoes, then Poke Gear, we'll see 11 cards deep into the deck. But if Poke Gear is used first and then Trekking Shoes and Greninja, we could just draw the exact same cards off of the Greninja and Shoes that we saw in the Poke Gear. So we want to use in the order that like essentially digs deeper into the deck. We can also think about Nest Ball and Vessel in the same way. So I'd really just always think about what you're looking for. Like we have Nest Ball, Trekking Shoes, and Vessel. We're looking for more Pokemon. We would play the Vessel, then the Trekking Shoes, then the Nest Ball. So if we play the Nest Ball first, it decreases the odds that we'll find a Pokemon off of the Trekking Shoes. And if you're wondering where Pokestop comes in in some of these examples, I will be talking about Pokestop a little bit in a couple of the examples I'm gonna do in a second. And I'm going to go more into the odds of hitting things off of Pokey Stop at the end of this section. I wanted to start with this example because I've seen this get messed up probably way too many times. And with a hand like this, you want a Prime Catcher. What I see happen probably a little too often is people will just start off by attaching the Fighting Energy to the Raging Bolt with the Lightning Energy attached. But to most efficiently use your energy here, what you would do is... Radiant Greninja away the Fighting Energy. Use your Prime Catcher, use Teal Dance, attach the Grass to the Ogre Pond, retreat the Ogre Pond, and then retrieval both of the energies back into your hand. And then you can attach one and Teal Dance with the other Ogre Pond or just have another energy for next turn. This seems super simple, but I've definitely seen this combination of Greninja and efficiently using energy retrievals in this deck get messed up like quite a few times. You always want to just take the extra one second to think about your hand to see like how you can most efficiently use your cards to get the best effect. And while most of the time we want to use Vessel before Trekking Shoes, this hand is an example where we would not want to pull the energy out of the deck before we use Trekking Shoes because ideally we would just like hit a Lightning or a Fighting off of the Trekking Shoes to then use with Sada. But if we don't, 
then we would just play the vessel and get a lightning and a fighting, maybe attach one to the active raging bolt and discard the other one with Squawkabilly and don't even play the pokey gear. All right, so this is another kind of weird hand, but what I would do is start vessel away the fighting, grab grass and lightning energy, and then use teal dance to attach the grass and draw a card because it just sees you a free card. There's really no downside. And then if it's like that's an S ball or something, then I would play that and get a Raging Bolt. But if not, I would just use Pokey Stop. I'd probably just rip the Pokey Stop right here because you just get to see three cards and there's like a 90% chance that we see an item card here and get to thin out the deck a little more. It's also gonna help us for so when we use Trekking Shoes, we have more information to know whether or not we want to discard that card or not. And and then after the track and shoes is when we should use pokey gear as long as we have found a way to get a raging bolt because if we don't have a raging bolt down there's really no point in trying to get sada off of the pokey gear and we would just like attach the bravery charm and squawk the hand away all right this hand we're going to try to figure out how to play it out to give ourselves the highest odds to hit a sada off the pokey gear if you want to stop and do that you can pause it here if not, first you would vessel away the fighting, get lightning and grass, nest ball for Greninja, discard one of the energy with Greninja, and play out any of the cards you get off of the Greninja. Use trekking shoes, play out any of the cards you get off that, and then last use the pokey gear. And doing things this way, we are kind of seeing 14 cards deep into the deck with the pokey gear, instead of if we used it first, we would just see seven and be able to see those same cards off the Greninja. All right, so this is the last example. And this is more of a thinning thing. We're trying to hit Sato off of the Greninja or the Ogre Pond. And instead of just benching the Ogre Pond out of hand, what we'd want to do is Nest Ball for another Ogre Pond out of the deck and then use Vessel to get two more energy out of the deck and then draw with Greninja and then Ogre Pond. In this example, there are no Sadas in the discard pile yet, but if there were, we would, of course, pal pad those in before drawing with the Greninja or Ogre Pond. And that brings me to another point that I've definitely seen people mess up. If you're at a turn where you need to hit Sada to not lose the game, basically, like we need to take a knockout to stay in the prize trade and we have a pal pad in hand, it's just worth playing the pal pad to put the Sadas from the discard pile back into the deck, especially with decks like this. There's really no point in like saving the pal pad forever. Like the games are pretty fast with these aggressive decks. And the only thing typically that you'd want to save the pal pad for is to get back a second boss. And if that's not needed for the prize trade, then just throwing the Sadas back in like before a random pokey gear or something is definitely worth doing. Also, if you have a pal pad in hand, there's really no reason to not rip a pokey stop. Maybe if there is like your last Raging Bolt in the deck and you can't mill it and you're out of Super Odds or Night Stretchers or whatever, that would be a time when you wouldn't do that. But for the most part, the only cards that we're worried about milling with Pokestop is supporter cards. So usually the Pal Pad will make it safe to just rip the Pokestop. Also, on the other side of that, we don't always have to play every single card out of our hand. Like if we already have an attack and everything that we need, then it's fine to save some vessels or not spin the pokey stop. But something really important to remember with that is that not only are we looking for resources for that turn, but we're trying to thin our deck for later turns because I fell into this trap a lot at one point where I would have a supporter in my hand, but I didn't really need anything else. So I would just not even play a supporter. And the next turn I would realize, oh, I should have needed to play that research because I needed to find boss for this turn. So it's always something to think about if you need to get closer to a supporter for next turn or just thin some junk out of your deck that is not needed to win the game or just stuff that we wouldn't want to find off in Iono. And thinning is always important, especially with a decks like this. We can usually really effectively thin the deck with all the vessels and stuff like that. The deck can be gotten down to just resources that are needed, but it's also to important Important to remember that nest balls and vessels in itself can be resources like nest ball can be your last attacker. It can be an ogre pond to draw a couple cards and then vessel could be the energy that you need to draw more cards of the hand attachment that is needed to win a game. So that's always something to think about when to not get rid of every last one of your item cards 
Unless it's like there's no basic energy left in the deck, then Vessel becomes useless and all of them should be gotten rid of. Or if we have every single one of our Pokemon that we'll need for the remainder of the game, Nest Ball is fine to get rid of. So now I'm just going to talk about some probability. I'm going to do a more in-depth video on this in the future. But first of all, for a lot of these examples, I'm just going to be using a 40 card deck because you start the game with like 46 cards in deck and then you play nest balls and stuff like that out of your hand and, you know, get a few cards out. So 40 will give us a good percentage to work off of. Now, the chances of hitting a supporter card that you have four of in the deck off a pokey gear just using it blindly into a 40 card deck is 55.3%. The odds of hitting an item off of Pokey Stop are 88%. The odds of hitting one of four Sod in the deck with 40 cards left is 28%. And if there are only three in the deck, it is 21%. And it does only increase if you don't hit a Sada, it does only increase your odds of hitting the Sada off Poke Gear by around 3 to 6%. It's only 3% if you don't hit any items that take more cards out of your deck with it. But if you hit like a Vessel, it'll increase the odds of getting the Sada by around 6%. Now this is where I am a little conflicted because on the 1 in 4 times that we hit a Sada off our Poke Stop, it will decrease the odds of our Poke Gear hitting by 10%. So that is a little rough and just maybe want to present like the exact odds so all of you can make your own decisions. It is also important to note with percentages, it's not like, oh, you used Pokestop three times and didn't hit Asada. Now it's the fourth time you're guaranteed to hit one. Every single time that you use a Pokestop, you have like a 72% chance of not hitting Sada if using it into a 40 card deck with four Sadas in it. So 72% is pretty high. That means most of the time we're not going to hit a Sada off it and we will only like reap the rewards of the 3 to 6% increase on the Poke Gear. But every once in a while a Sada will get milled and then it decreases the odds by 10%. So that can definitely be a little rough and is always something to think about. Now I'm just going to go over matchups a little bit. Obviously with the goal of this deck is to just take two prizes every single turn of the game. So... If our opponent has like a Rotom on the bench or something and a one prize on the active, we're going to want to do everything that we can to knock out the Rotom for two prizes. And typically it's going to be a Charizard deck that has that. If they are not playing the Dustnor line, I don't even think that we should take the single prize. We want to wait until we can take two prizes because if they do not have the Dustnor in the deck, there's no way that they're going to one shot our Raging Bolt. And if we do take one prize, they can just slap on a Defiance Band and one shot the Raging Bolt or just bring up one of our Ogre Ponds and take two prizes. If we have a Squawkabilly on the bench, they we also are always running the risk of them just bossing that up if we pass for a turn. So that's something to keep in mind as well. This is also going to be a much harder matchup now that people are probably going to be playing a list more similar to Tord's where they're going to be able to stream Radiant Charizards the last couple turns of the game or the last four prizes a lot easier than they ever were before. And that was basically the way that Raging Bolt lost this matchup before was when they took their, you know, went down to two prizes with Radiant Zard. We could only take one prize and then we'd go down to one prize and they would take their last two. So I would only ever choose to not take a knockout if... They have a fully set up board and we have no Squawkabilly in play and we know that they do not play a Dusclops or they don't have like a Duskull on the bench or anything. Because in theory what should happen after that is we would get into kind of a passing war where they would start hitting into our Raging Bolt for 30s with their Charmanders until they can take a one shot with their Charizard EX. Or if it's the version of the deck that, like I said, can just recycle Radiant Charizard, they can really just kind of do whatever they want and they're going to be able to take back the favor of the prize trade a little bit later in the game. So that is going to be a very negative matchup now. Against really any one prize decks, like a one prize focus Law Zone deck or Ancient Box, what we're going to want to do is try and kind of pivot between our Pokemon 
and make it so that they're two-shotting us as much as possible, like specifically against Ancient Box, I would start off by attacking with Ogre Pond, let him hit into it, retreat into a Raging Bolt, let him hit into that, and then switch into another Raging Bolt and hope that they still cannot one-shot that and just kind of make it so that when they're one-shotting our Pokemon, make it so that when they're doing enough damage to one-shot our Pokemon anyway, they're hitting into already damaged Pokemon that they had to hit into earlier and it just becomes kind of a waste of an attack for them because the problem with one prize matchups with decks like this is we can go down to three prizes and as long as when we take our third prize they can one shot one of our guys the next turn they can still win in three turns and win the prize trade before we can win the game because we will go down to three they'll take two prizes go down to four we'll go down to two They'll go down to two and then we'll go down to one and they will win the game. Another way that we can tr kind of try to get around this is most decks should be playing Pheasantipity now. So that's where the unfair stamp comes in. You hit them with the unfair stamp. Hopefully they are forced to put the Fez in play and we can use that to catch up and win the prize trade that we normally would have lost. Like I just explained. All right, Reggie Drago. We're definitely going to want to be careful what we put on our bench in this matchup because even if we are a turn ahead on the prize trade, they can win in two attacks by caroming three of our things like a Squawkabilly, a Pheasantipity, and the Ogre Pond if they can get it back into the active. So we definitely want to be kind of careful about that. Just keep an eye out for that line. But really, we're just going to want to put as much pressure as we can on their Reggie Dragos because they usually can only get two Reggie Dragos V Stars fully set up. So if we knock out both of them, and unfair stamp them on that last turn there it's going to make it a little bit harder for them to get an attack with radiant charizard and that really is going to be how they win the game or if we have a bravery charm we can put it on our guy that last turn or put it on one of the guys that they're trying to double carom snipe up against anything like roaring moony x Maridon, any of those type of decks just go second take the first two prizes and don't whiff a knockout Unfortunately, there's really not much more we can do if we fall behind. Like I was I've said about several of these decks, we can try and hit them with an unfair stamp and hope that they whiff an attack, but that's kind of unlikely at this point with Pheasantipity being so strong. Now Lugia can also be a really hard matchup, but all we can really do in that case is go second and hope they can only put down one Lugia and try and knock it out. Also, sometimes if they put down a second Lugia, that will also be enough for us to win the game if they put the second Lugia down and then also have to bench a Luminion. And maybe like if they can't find their uh, Legacy Energy for some reason. But the Legacy Energy really is going to be what gets them ahead in the prize trade. So if that deck becomes popular enough, I think a Temple of Sinnoh in this deck could be um, pretty good. Gardevoir is another pretty bad matchup, but all we can really do is try and go second and just go as fast as we possibly can. One thing that could be good in this matchup is not putting down a Squawk Ability because Screamtailing a Squawk Ability is going to be the easiest way for them to take two prizes, but also just using Unfair Stamp at a good time will also help in this matchup. It may be trying to focus down the Gardevoir EX at opportune times would be good as well. Now Iron Thorns is probably the only matchup I can think of right now that we would want to go first in just because we want to start attaching as many energies as possible. We could also use um, Motivate on Squawkabilly at a good time to hit them for 20 and get two energy in play. That'll lower the amount of energy we need for a knockout down to three, and it'll also get two energy in play for us. And another thing that I would keep in mind in that matchup is if you can avoid it, try to not two-shot them with Raging Bolt attacks because they can always just penny up that Raging Bolt and unless they're knocking out a Raging Bolt with energy, it's worth it just to wait a turn to get the one shot. We could also try and focus down the energy that they move to make it so that maybe they miss an attack. Against any stall decks, we're going to want to try and focus down their engine Pokemon, their Rotom V, their Pidgeots, and also avoid putting Pokemon like Greninja into play. We'd really like to only have Pokemon in play that we can attack with in that matchup. Now, Goldengo is another hard matchup. Ideally, I think what we would do is put a Pokemon, a one prize Pokemon into the active, 
until they evolve up into a two prizer or until they put a two prizer into play for us to knock out and then try and make them take one prize and go down to fives on the turn that we can take two prizes and go down to four because if we go second and just knock out a gimme ghoul they will win the prize trade all right and that is how to play raging bolt i really hope that was helpful um yeah like or dislike comment and subscribe getting really close to 500 so that is pretty cool and 500 and a thousand are kind of like the first goals for monetization and stuff and thanks so much for watch watching and have a good one